These weapons are so bad, it's a wonder they're still in use even by the world's mightiest powers. The Littoral Combat Ship, United States Get used to seeing the United States on this list, because for the world's most powerful military it sure has wasted billions on boondoggles. The Littoral Combat Ship was supposed to redefine naval strategy for the American Navy. Starting in the early 2000s, China began to build up the capability to deny the U.S. Navy access to the South China Sea and the Western Pacific. Known as Anti-Access Area Denial, or A2AD, China's strategy to overcome the superior American Navy was to simply make it too dangerous for it to operate anywhere near China's Pacific interests. With the combination of forward-deployed air power on artificial islands and long-range ballistic missile batteries, China has effectively created overlapping zones of danger for any U.S. warship daring to oppose Chinese interests. The math is firmly on China's side. A modern warship costs billions, while an anti-ship missile costs only millions. Even if it takes 10 missiles to kill a warship, China still comes out on top financially by a long run, not to mention the loss of trained seamen on said warship. The solution was to create a smaller yet still incredibly lethal breed of warship with some stealth characteristics that could operate in very shallow waters close to shore. Thus, the littoral combat ship was born, and the US Navy began to dump billions into what might be the worst warship ever designed. On paper, the littoral combat ship is capable of combat operations close to enemy shores, using its superior speed and stealth to avoid enemy fire. Its modular structure allows it to rapidly change mission profiles. One day it could be inserting special forces onto an enemy beach and supporting them with drones launched from its deck. A few days later, after swapping out modules, it could be conducting electronic signals intelligence. Its complement of missiles and guns would allow it to face off against targets much larger than itself, while its superior speed would then zip it away from any seriously threatening contact. And it would be cheap, costing only a fraction of a large destroyer or frigate. Instead of any of this, the US Navy spent tens of billions on a ship that can't fight. For starters, the US Navy shot itself in the foot right out of the gate by hiring two different contractors to build its LCS design. Lockheed Martin would build part of the LCS fleet, while the other part would be built by Austal. This meant that there was no standardization of parts between the two ships, a logistical nightmare, and even construction materials varied. Austal built ships with aluminum, which has a low melting point that would prove catastrophic to warships when the USS Bonhomme Richard caught fire and its aluminum roof melted. Both ships were vulnerable to enemy fire, with critical systems being placed closer together, meaning one well-placed or lucky missile strike would effectively cripple the entire vessel. The ships from both companies also had a baffling lack of redundancy, a standard shipbuilding practice since the dawn of modern warship construction. Next, the modular design that had been so attractive to the Navy and promised to be a flexible boat capable of fulfilling multiple roles turned out to be a failure. Modules were too difficult to swap and frequently created maintenance issues. Despite this, the Navy dumped another $7.6 billion into trying to achieve the dream of modular design, only to meet with failure and abandon those plans altogether. Shoddy construction only added to the woes of the LCS, as ships of the class experienced frequent breakdowns and the lowest ready rates of any ship in the Navy, possibly any Navy. In 2015 and 2016, four out of six LCS suffered major breakdowns. The cause? Poor manufacture of engine parts, leading to debris and shavings damaging engine parts. One ship had seawater flood its engine. In 2017, an LCS suffered a broken steering cable which left it marooned in Montreal, Canada. After repairs, the ship was unable to navigate winter conditions and became stuck. In 2020, an LCS lost all electrical power on its way back to the US from Latin America and became stranded in the open ocean. The problems with the LCS class have been so pronounced that the ship earned the moniker Little Crappy Ship and the Navy finally decided to retire the entire fleet in the coming years, despite some of the ships only being six years old. That's a far cry from the average 30-40 to 40 year lifespan of any other warship. Our next worst weapon still in use was so bad that when news of its underperformance in combat leaked out of the public, it caused an outrage. L-85A1 Assault Rifle Great Britain Development on the L-85A1 began in the 60s, with the goal of producing a revolutionary infantry weapon by the 1980s. The result would be a weapon so bad the UK government tried to suppress it from the voters, and ended up shelling out tens of millions of pounds to try and fix it. The weapon was meant to be developed in two variants, automatic infantry rifle and light squad support weapon. By 1984, the rifle was formally adopted by the UK Army, and despite worrying reports of serious issues with the weapon, the UK ignored warning signs of serious design failures until it was thrown into the crucible of war. During Operation Desert Storm, the rifle showed just how terribly designed it was. First, its design made it difficult to maintain in the field outside of a dedicated armory. 
Fixes that could be quickly implemented in the field required the expertise and tools of an armor, something an infantryman might have no access to during prolonged and intense combat operations. Maintenance issues were compounded by a lack of quality control during its first production run. After the rifle's production was moved to a new factory in Nottingham, quality control improved, but not dramatically so. The harsh desert environment of Iraq also proved to be too much for the rifle, with sand and grit causing frequent stoppages. However, simple design and material choices ended up putting British lives at serious risk. Firstly, the rifle was not ambidextrous, causing issues for left-handed shooters. The magazine release button was also unprotected, leading to frequent accidental releases of magazines in the middle of combat. The magazine well was made of very thin material, which created the risk of bending and thus making the current magazine impossible to eject or stopping a new magazine from being fed. The magazines themselves were also an issue, with shoddy construction leading to magazines that could break or split open. The polymer body of the weapon was also very brittle, and when experiencing extreme cold could split apart. After the war, the UK government would go on to spend tens of millions into what would effectively be a redesign of the weapon. While upgraded variants have proven to overcome the many flaws of the original design, plenty of originals remain in circulation and threaten the success of a British infantry on the battlefield. Our next weapon is so bad, it needs a timeout anytime the weather gets hot. Heckler & Koch G36 Germany after reunification, the newly reborn nation of Germany desperately needed a replacement infantry assault rifle. East and West German designs were wildly different, and to bring the new German nation in line with its NATO allies, it adopted the Heckler & Koch G36. The weapon was extremely accurate and chambered for a NATO standard 5.56 ammunition. Its revolutionary design delivered one of the most lethal and effective infantry rifles in the world, until it saw combat for the first time. April 2, 2010, the German army had been deployed to Afghanistan in support of NATO operations. Taliban forces launched a surprise attack at the German ISAF HQ in Kunduz, North Afghanistan. In the chaos of battle, 32 German paratroopers become cut off and are in threat of encirclement and annihilation. The men engage in a nine-hour fighting retreat, which becomes deadly when their rifles begin to immediately fail. Three German soldiers will die that day. The reason for their casualties? German soldiers were unable to hit their targets. An investigation into the performance of the G36 was immediately launched, with stunning revelations. Because of low-quality polymer used in its construction, the barrel would overheat in temperatures as low as 76 degrees. After just 60 rounds, the polymer supporting the barrel would begin to sag, causing serious degradation of accuracy, as much as a half meter at 200 meters and a whopping 6 meters at 500 meters. A German court would go on to rule that Heckler & Koch were not responsible for the catastrophic failure of the design and instead lay the blame on the German government itself, as the rifle had been originally procured for peacetime missions and not for heavy, sustained combat operations. The design was ruled adequate for the role it was originally envisioned for. Currently, the rifle remains in service all over the world, though the German military is replacing remaining G36s in 2022. Next up, it's even more Heckler & Koch problems for the German army. Heckler & Koch MG5 – Germany Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And yet, the German army immediately ran into problems with their planned procurement of yet another Heckler & Koch weapon for the squad light machine gun role. The MG5 looks impressive. Its space-age design promises ease of maintenance and reliability. Yet just two months before its formal adoption by the German military in 2015, the order was cancelled pending serious redesign. According to Tobias Linder, Germany's Green Party federal defense expert, the weapon had serious enough flaws to be declared only conditionally fit for combat use. Immediately after, rumors of accuracy issues began to surface. Originally meant to enter service in 2015, the weapon is only now expected to be formally adopted after seven years of redesign and test fact that leaves the German infantrymen with little faith in yet another Heckler & Koch product. Our next worst weapon still in use is so slow that its firing rate is not measured in rounds per minute, but rather minutes per round. M1989 – North Korea The M1989 is a weapon with one goal strike Seoul from the demilitarized zone that separates North and South Korea, a distance of about 15 miles. In that regard, the weapon succeeds with flying colors, even if it can only fire once every few minutes. The actual firing rate of the M1989 is unknown given the secretive nature of North Korea. However, the weapon's predecessor, the M1978, had a firing rate of only two rounds every five minutes. As no major redesigns are obvious, the 1989 is believed to have a similar rate of fire. Given the incredible speeds of modern combat, this weapon is as obvious 
obsolete as the bow and arrow. Adapted from a Cold War-era Soviet coastal defense battery, the M1989 is North Korea's solution to its lack of long-range striking power. Knowing it could not possibly achieve air superiority against South Korea and its American allies, North Korea fields the M1989 in large numbers, threatening South Korea's capital with sheer volume of fire, at least initially as these massive slow-firing weapons would quickly become prey to attack helicopters, ground attack planes, and counter-artillery fire. The platform is at least self-propelled, but requires lengthy setup time making them incapable of shoot-and-scoot operations. It also features a major upgrade from its predecessor in the capability of carrying 12 rounds internally. For any form of sustained operation, the M1989 requires an additional support truck per platform to carry ammunition and fuel. In an age of fast-moving combined arms warfare, the M1989 poses an initial risk to targets but is easily and quickly suppressed by counter-battery fire or ground-attack aircraft. Our next worst weapon is an aging dinosaur woefully out of place amongst the world's most high-tech military, AAV-7, United States. The AAV-7, assault amphibious vehicle, has been ferrying U.S. Marines from ship to shore for 50 years and is in need of immediate replacement. The vehicle has enjoyed a distinguished service record protecting U.S. Marines during peacekeeping operations in Lebanon in 1982 through 1984, conducting a successful amphibious landing in Granada in 1983, and pushing back Saddam's forces in the 1991 Gulf War. However, the AAV-7 proved to be unable to keep up with modern threats when it was criticized for providing inadequate protection to troops during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Vulnerable to mortar, RPG, tank, and artillery fire, the U.S. lost eight vehicles during the Battle of nasir Yah, after which it became obvious that the Marines were in need of an upgrade. However, with priority shifted to the War on Terror, securing a modern amphibious assault vehicle was low on any future acquisition list. That changed dramatically starting in the 2010s, when it became obvious that America's next conflict would likely take place in the South Pacific against China. This would be a war defined by amphibious operations against well-defended Chinese positions on outlying islands, and the AAV-7 was simply not up to the task. Its 45mm armor no longer provides adequate protection against modern threats, and its Mark 19 grenade launcher and 50 caliber machine machine gun are insufficient firepower for threats against a near-peer adversary such as China. With expected losses of ground support aircraft to Chinese air defenses, AAV-7 needs to be able to fight on its own against armored threats, a task it is simply not up to at the moment. In 2003, the AAV was scheduled for replacement with the Advanced Assault Amphibious Vehicle Program, which would feature three times the speed in the water, twice the armor and superior weapons. However, ultimately the program was canceled in 2011. Today, the AAV is slated to be replaced with the Super AV, which features upgraded armor and firepower. Our next worst weapon was supposed to revolutionize naval warfare again, but couldn't even fire its main gun. Zumwalt Class Destroyer, United States. It's the strangest and most high-tech surface vessel in the world but it's also all but defenseless against most threats. The Zumwalt-class destroyer was supposed to be yet another wonder weapon from the U.S. Navy. At the time of its conception in the 1990s, the U.S. Navy was the undisputed king of the seas. Analysts saw no naval threat to the United States and thus conceived of future naval combat vessels as requiring a robust shore bombardment capability, ideally in the form of long-range cannons that could be as accurate as a cruise missile with comparable range but a fraction of the cost. Thus, the Zumwalt was conceived. With an emphasis on stealth, the Zumwalt has a radar signature of a small fishing vessel, and thanks to automation, its crew is less than half of that of a traditional destroyer or frigate. The ship also features cooled exhaust and electrically driven engines for reducing its infrared signature, as well as the capability to generate more electricity than any other ship in its class, a prerequisite for integration of advanced future weapons such as railguns and lasers. Perhaps the ship's greatest failure was its main armament, the long-range land attack projectile. These GPS-guided shells would be able to strike with pinpoint accuracy any target up to 60 miles away. However, each round ended up being prohibitively expensive, costing a whopping $800,000 at the time of the cancellation of the project. With a 600-round capacity, each Zumwalt would have cost $480 million just to arm it. The Navy desperately searched for replacement ammunition for the Zumwalt's advanced gun system, but just last November decided to ultimately scrap plans for a cannon altogether and simply arm each of the three vessels commissioned with future hypersonic missiles. Further failures come with the ship's radar. Originally slated to house the Spy 4 volume search radar alongside a Spy 3 high-resolution targeting radar, the Navy instead opted to modify its Spy 3 radar to handle volume search as well, seriously degrading the ship's ability to detect airborne targets and defend itself or 
or other ships in the fleet. This leaves the Zumwalt with no operational deck gun and only short-range evolved Sea Sparrow air defense missiles. While it's capable of firing larger missiles from its cells, the ship lacks Aegis combat system capabilities and thus must rely on networked ships to guide its own missiles to target. The capability to be seriously degraded in confrontation with a near-peer foe such as China. Its close-in weapon system was also degraded from the standard 57mm chain gun to a 30mm cannon. The famed radar cross-section was seriously compromised when in another cost-cutting measure, lower-quality steel and non-flush sensor and communication masts were installed. In the end, the Zumwalt can't do anything it was slated to do, and must rely on future weapons and network capabilities to carry the fight to the enemy. It's just another massive waste of taxpayer money in a long series of post-Cold War-era military boondoggles that have eroded America's capability to fight and win against a pure adversary. Our next worst weapon in service today was supposed to rule the air. Instead, it showcased a lack of technological maturity from one of the world's biggest powers, J-20 Stealth Fighter, China. The J-20 is a massive leap forward for a nation who in 1990 had an air force incapable of challenging even just the U.S. Navy. However, the aircraft is without a doubt the worst of the current fifth-generation jets in service today. Technical details are difficult to ascertain due to its secretive nature of the aircraft, but it's immediately obvious the plane has a much larger radar cross-section than the F-22, the F-35, or Russia's Su-57. This is because of the canards the aircraft must incorporate because of another massive deficiency in Chinese aircraft design jet engines. China has yet to produce a domestic jet engine with capabilities comparable to the US or Russia, and relies on lower-quality export model engines from Russia for its aircraft. The J-20's engines can produce 125 kN of thrust compared to the F-22's 156 kN and the F-35's 190 kN. China's weaker engines mean the plane requires canards for stability, increasing its radar profile, and is much more limited in the types of weapons it can bring to battle. In a dogfight scenario, the plane's lower thrust also also puts it in serious jeopardy against its American or Russian competitors. Recently, J-20s have begun to be fitted with more powerful Chinese jet engines, but even these fail to match the American engines in performance, still leaving the J-20 short. Despite being touted as a fifth-generation fighter, the plane's stealth is also in serious question as the Indian Air Force has multiple times claimed to have detected the J-20 at long ranges while using older radar systems. China has already moved past the J-20 is looking ahead at a sixth-generation plane using the lessons learned on the J-20. Despite its impressive catching up to the more technologically advanced Russian and American aerospace industries, China is still lagging considerably behind both nations, and its current fleet of J-20s are vulnerable in combat against its most likely opponent in the coming years, the United States Navy and Air Force. Now go check out most successful weapons ever invented, or click this other video instead.